Well, thank you very much for the invitation to join you, even remotely, uh, Shastin. Uh, I have very fond memories of my time at the RME meeting in Stockholm in 2014, where uh, you all showed us enormous hospitality and uh, style. So I'm very pleased to join you again for this week's conference. Uh, I'm going to talk first about dysautonomia in MECFS and long COVID. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. And we'll talk a little bit about the observations on MECFS and the uh, initial work that drew attention to the overlap between orthostatic intolerance and MECFS. We'll look at some of the evidence about orthostatic intolerance that we did as part of the Institute of Medicine review in the US back in 2015. And then I wanna present some new data from your neighbors in the Netherlands on reductions in cerebral blood flow. Uh, and then talk a little bit about dysautonomia in long COVID because I think as it has been a very uh, treatable condition in MECFS, it's turning out in our hands anyway to be a very treatable component of long COVID. And then I'll end with a couple of clinical lessons. So the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science in the US convened a committee in 2014. I was fortunate to be a member of that committee. And we published a report in February of 2015 called Beyond uh, MECFS, Redefining an Illness. The chair of the committee, Ellen Clayton, a pediatrician and ethicist, uh, concluded that MECFS is a serious, chronic, complex, multi-system disease that often can profoundly limit the health and activity of affected patients. We defined these as core symptoms. One was a substantial impairment in the activities that were well tolerated before the illness, usually accompanied by profound fatigue, but this item put the focus on the impairment in activities. The second core symptom was post-exertional malaise, the increase in a variety of symptoms, not just fatigue after exceeding the individual's uh, cognitive or physical activity. And it turns out that there are other triggers to PEM, including orthostatic stress and neural strain. The third core symptom was unrefreshing sleep and either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. And the symptoms we specified should occur at least half the time and with at least moderate severity. When we reviewed the information on orthostatic intolerance, the committee concluded that sufficient evidence indicates a high prevalence of orthostatic intolerance in MECFS as measured by objective heart rate and blood pressure abnormalities during standing or head up tilt testing, or by patient reported exacerbation of orthostatic symptoms with standing in day-to-day -day life. These findings indicate that orthostatic intolerance is a common and clinically important finding in MECFS. This was after a review of hundreds of papers on the topic. Very soon after our report came out, the opposing view uh, was published almost uh, faster than you can imagine something getting to print because it came out less than a month later in Medscape. And this was work by uh, Peter White who concluded instead that orthostatic intolerance is questionable when good epidemiologic studies find that objective evidence of orthostatic intolerance occurs in a relatively small minority of patients. And I wanna show you what I think is the study he meant by a good epidemiologic study. Uh, and in another uh, uh, publication, he said, some would question whether orthostatic intolerance is a key feature of the illness. So, what about the good epidemiologic studies he means? Well, one of them was the CDC Wichita study where they looked at 74 patients who were eligible for head up tilt testing. 41 were excluded, uh, uh, some due to age greater than 55, some were on medications that would affect the response to tilt testing. Some had a heart rate over 120 and a rhythm disturbance and others had abnormal screening labs. This left 33 who were eligible for the head up tilt, 23 of whom refused, leaving them with 10 patients for the head up tilt. This was only 14% of the original sample. And I think any student in an epidemiology class would agree that this is not representative of the original group that was under study. 
So I think the, any result from this study has to be thrown out. The implications of these two different views for the treatment of MECFS, one uh, are, are, are quite straightforward. One is that uh, many of us as clinicians who deal with MECFS feel that treating orthostatic intolerance is important in managing MECFS symptoms. In contrast, those who follow the Peter White view, uh, and many of these are psychiatrists, uh, put out treatment guidelines that emphasize CBT for MECFS, and they make no mention of the utility of assessing for or treating comorbid orthostatic intolerance. Uh, and I think you know where I stand on that debate, uh, but I wanna show you data that I think uh, completely bury the argument that this is uh, not an important part of the illness. The initial observations that I've been able to found, find that link hypotension and tachycardia to uh, these illnesses were published by Alexander McLean and Edgar Allen in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1940. They said, we have given the name orthostatic tachycardia to a syndrome which is characterized by an excessive acceleration of the heart when patients change from the recumbent to the erect posture. Orthostatic exhaustion, blurring of vision, weakness on exercise, and syncopal or fainting episodes may occur. This is a syndrome which seems identical with effort syndrome, irritable heart, or neurocirculatory asthenia. These were the synonyms of the day for what we now call MECFS. They published a later paper that showed that the main problem with orthostatic tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension was some sort of defect in the return of venous blood to the heart. And these were seminal observations that stand to this day. We got interested, un, we, we were unaware of that work, uh, found it later, but we're interested in the overlap of the symptoms of MECFS and those of one form of, of orthostatic intolerance, neurally mediated or vasovagal hypotension. And we uh, described this hypothesis in a case series in The Lancet in 1995. All seven of the patients had abnormal tilt tests and four of the seven had a marked improvement in their fatigue when we treated their hypotension. We went on to a larger study with my colleagues shown here, Isam Buhalega from Saudi Arabia and Hugh Calkins who runs our tilt table lab at Hopkins. And this was a controlled study of adolescents and adults uh, where we looked at 23 MECFS patients and 14 healthy controls. It was a pilot study, but the findings were so, so striking that we had to publish this. We found that a number of people had symptoms compatible with orthostatic intolerance. So 96% of MECFS patients reported lightheadedness, 83% had excessive sweating, 78% had blurring of their vision, and 43% had had at least one episode of syncope. The conditions that exacerbated their fatigue included physical exertion, which we would expect just because they had MECFS, but also some of the things that bring on orthostatic intolerance. So heat, uh, like a hot shower, prolonged standing, hot environments, and after a lightheaded episode. When we put them on a 70 degree head up tilt table. So they were no, almost standing. Uh, this provoked a very bad exacerbation in symptoms for our patients. All of them had worse fatigue. Many had lightheadedness, warmth, and nausea, while the control population was simply bored being on a uh, tilt table for 45 minutes. More importantly, we were able to pr provoke hypotension. Stage one of the tilt test involved the 45 minutes of upright posture. If they tolerated that, we brought the table down to a flat position, started a, a catecholamine isoproteranol, brought the table back up for 15 minutes. This was designed to raise their heart rate 20% or so. If they tolerated that 15 minutes, the table came down and we used a higher dose of isoproteranol for stage three for 10 minutes. That is rarely used anymore because it starts bringing out hypotension in healthy people, as you can see here. But if you focus just on the stage one tilt, 45 minutes upright, 16 of 23 MECFS patients developed hypotension versus none of the controls. And in 
in all, when we did the odds ratio for an abnormal tilt in those who had ME-CFS, this was a whopping number, 55. And even the lower 95% confidence interval was a 5.4, which was a really striking uh, uh, measure of the strength of this association. One of the more important parts of this early paper was that we treated patients openly for their hypotension with things like fludrocortisone, beta blockers, mitodrin, and others. Their overall sense of well being, ranging from zero meaning dying to 100, which was as good as you could imagine feeling, rose from a mean of 35 at entry to close to 70 after four months of open treatment. And you can see that some people had a really striking improvement, others were more modest, but this is still our experience to this day. When you look at the evidence from the Institute of Medicine review, uh, all of the pediatric studies of, of orthostatic intolerance have found a higher rate of orthostatic intolerance in our patients. Julian Stewart, who's a main contributor to orthostatic intolerance work, studied 26 with ME-CFS, 18 of whom developed postural tachycardia syndrome, and 22% developed hypotension during the tilt test. Overall, he found that 96% had orthostatic intolerance, and many patients had acrocyanosis, this purple discoloration of the uh, dependent limbs that you can see on examination. Tanaka in Japan found that even just with seven minutes of active standing, patients had delayed recovery of their brain oxygenation in three quarters versus just 10% of the controls. Vigard Willer in Norway actually uh, brought out uh, even bigger differences between the groups by putting patients through just a 20 degree head up tilt test. This was enough to provoke uh, autonomic changes in the patients, but not in the controls. When, as part of the Institute of Medicine review, we looked at uh, 14 studies looking at the rates of orthostatic intolerance in the first 45 minutes, this slide is meant to be unreadable, but the range of orthostatic abnormalities was from 0% in a couple of studies to 79% in others. And summing these, we saw differences between uh, adult patients and controls 41.7% versus 14.6%. Uh, the newer data suggests uh, that this is a much higher number with true abnormalities. This is a schematic that shows the abnormalities that occur physiologically in people who are standing or on a tilt test. Many who develop problems have increased blood pooling in the dependent circulation possibly from a defect in vasoconstriction, like was uh, posited back in 1944. Patients seem to have a reduction in their intravascular volume of about 10%, and this is a symmetric reduction in both red cells and plasma. But as a result of these two problems, when people are upright, they get a big reduction in cerebral blood flow. That elicits a marked increase in the sympathoadrenal response, and the phenotype can be either classical orthostatic hypotension with a drop of 20 millimeters of mercury in systolic or 10 in diastolic blood pressure, delayed orthostatic hypotension, which occurs after the three minute point that's required for the orthostatic hypotension, neurally mediated hypotension, POTS. And then we're learning that a large group of patients have a normal heart rate and blood pressure response to tilt, but still have a big reduction in cerebral blood flow that is clinically important. One of the best insights to this came from the work of uh, Linda Van Kampen and Franz Visser in Amsterdam. They came up with a new technique for measuring cerebral blood flow. They put a Doppler probe on each internal carotid and each vertebral artery measuring blood flow through those vessels for about 30 seconds each. So that over about a two or three minute period, they can tell you by adding up the flow through those vessels, what total cerebral blood flow inflow is. Here's an example of the Doppler uh, measurement of somebody's supine, and you can see that each heartbeat and withstanding, you don't need to be an ultrasonographer to realize that this person's blood flow through that vessel has reduced. Uh, they 
collected data from a large group of their patients evaluated consecutively. These, this is all of their data. I helped a little bit with some of the writing and uh, some of the discussions, but I wanna emphasize that this is their work. They had a huge number of patients, 429. This, this was about the same as the combined total in the 14 studies in the Institute of Medicine Review. Their patients exposed to a 70 degree, 30 minute tilt test uh, had these phenotypes. 58% had a normal heart rate and blood pressure, uh, and that was 100% of their controls. 14% had delayed orthostatic hypertension and 28% had postural tachycardia syndrome. These were the results of the differences between their cerebral blood flow supine and how much it fell during 30 minutes of head up tilt. Notice that the healthy controls had just a 7% reduction in brain blood flow. But if you take the entire group of MECFS patients, they had a 26% reduction. 90% of them, in fact, had a significant drop in cerebral blood flow. When you break down this 26%, those who had demonstrable POTS or delayed orthostatic hypotension had slightly worse cerebral blood flow. But importantly, those who had a normal heart rate and blood pressure response and uh, who we might have been tempted to say, gee, there's nothing wrong here, your blood pressure and heart rate and circulation are normal, they still had over a threefold greater reduction in cerebral blood flow than the healthy individuals did. So we think it's no wonder that they were lightheaded, tired, couldn't find the right word in conversation and had other symptoms that would be attributable to a reduction in brain blood flow. This shows that the degree of cerebral blood flow reduction mid-tilt also correlated with the number of symptoms reported at that moment. They've gone on to emphasize that you can uh, identify the same big 27% reduction in brain blood flow, even with the same 20 degree head up tilt testing that uh, Dr. Willer used in the Norwegian adolescents. They've shown as well that the same problem can pre be provoked just by prolonged sitting. Uh, here again is about a 27% reduction in uh, absolute cerebral blood flow during sitting uh, compared to healthy controls. Their work has also defined the fact that upright posture is capable of provoking problems with cognitive uh, function. So using a two-back or a three-back test of memory and attention, after the, immediately after the tilt test, patients have lower scores on these cognitive measures, and this persists for about a week. Some of the more behaviorally oriented uh, uh, people who write about MECFS dismiss all this work about orthostatic intolerance, blaming it on deconditioning. Uh, Dr. Van Kampen and Visser looked at this question and they said, well, if that's the case, then those who have a low uh, peak oxygen extraction on, tilt, on uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing should have worse cerebral blood flow. But what they showed is that regardless of the phenotype, normal heart rate and blood pressure response to tilt, POTS or delayed orthostatic hypertension, when you classified patients who had had both a cardiopulmonary exercise test and a tilt test based on whether they had no deconditioning, mild deconditioning or moderate deconditioning, there was no relationship between their deconditioning state and their cerebral blood flow. So this questions uh, this raises serious questions about whether deconditioning can be used as a major uh, explanation for orthostatic intolerance. Let's look now at dysautonomia in long COVID. This is a slide uh, just showing the heart rate response of a young woman that we, we saw in Baltimore uh, who had become ill in March of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. She was immediately lightheaded uh, and couldn't sit up at her desk. She's a research scientist and uh, had to have her colleagues bring over food in the early part of her illness because she was so lightheaded and intolerant of upright posture. 
She also was brilliant, but within the first two weeks of the illness, could not make out the numbers on her bank statement. She couldn't follow the plot of a comedy show on television. When we put her into a 10 minute standing test, her resting heart rate was 89. With standing, she had an immediate and progressive increase in heart rate such that she reached a heart rate of 166, which is extraordinary for just standing there. Her lightheadedness went from zero to eight or nine. She had much more brain fog and a lot of trouble answering our questions during this time. Uh, we published her case and that of two others in the Frontiers in Medicine in 21 to establish the fact that patients with long COVID also met criteria for ME-CFS and uh, POTS uh, when they were quite impaired. Others have made the same observations, uh, many focusing on POTS. The group at the Mayo Clinic uh, found that the most common finding, like uh, our colleagues in Amsterdam identified, the most common finding was orthostatic intolerance, often without objective hemodynamic abnormalities on tilt testing, but probably with uh, reductions in cerebral blood flow. Uh, Visser and Van Kampen also looked at symptoms in their first 10 long COVID patients, comparing them to the symptoms in the ME-CFS patients they have evaluated. And whether you look at fatigue, post-exertional malaise, headache, pain, unrefreshing sleep, and so on, there are no significant differences in the symptom clusters between the, their first 10 with long COVID and their ME-CFS patients. More importantly, when they looked at the cerebral blood flow measurements, at the bottom, you see the Doppler measurement of, in the left carotid artery supine. And this healthy control had an 8% reduction uh, after 30 minutes upright on the tilt table. At the top, you see a long COVID patient who had a lower uh, cerebral blood flow supine, but dropped 39% with standing. This is really quite striking. Uh, when they took their entire group of 10 long COVID patients, all of whom met criteria for ME-CFS and POTS, compared them to 20 ME-CFS patients with POTS and 20 with a normal heart rate and blood pressure response, you can see that the long COVID patients had even worse cerebral blood flow. Again, this goes against the idea that this could be due to deconditioning because these patients with uh, long COVID had only been sick for six, six to 12 months whereas the ME-CFS patients were more likely to have been sick for five years or so. I wanna end with some clinical lessons. One is that over 95% of our pediatric patients and, and at least 90% of adult ME-CFS patients have orthostatic intolerance, objectively confirmed by these extracranial Doppler measurements. And in fact, uh, Visser and Van Kampen have published about patients who were diagnosed as having psychogenic pseudosyncope as the explanation for their uh, episodes of collapse. Uh, the so-called psychogenic pseudosyncope patients using their Doppler measurements had sometimes 40% or worse reductions in brain blood flow when they were upright. So again, there was nothing psychogenic and nothing pseudo about their syncope. And I think in, unless we use these measures that are more objective and appropriate, uh, we will be at risk for miscategorizing patients. The second lesson is that cerebral blood flow reductions during upright posture are at least threefold greater in ME-CFS patients than they are in healthy controls. And orthostatic stress can provoke uh, cognitive dysfunction, increased pain, headaches, PEM, and many of the other symptoms of ME-CFS. So I think their work also shows that it's incorrect to view orthostatic intolerance as due exclusively to deconditioning. Uh, we feel that joint hypermobility is a risk factor for greater cerebral blood flow reductions among those with ME-CFS, and I'll be talking about that in the next talk. But any proposed model explaining the pathophysiology of ME-CFS, and I would submit that we also need to include long COVID in this, needs to somehow account for why uh, we see so much orthostatic intolerance. And 
Orthostatic intolerance remains one of the most treatable contributors to ME-CFS symptoms and to long COVID symptoms. So I'm gonna end there and uh, leave time for questions. Uh, I'd like to thank those who've supported our work uh, from the early 1990s onward. We've had grants from the National Institute of Health, the US Department of Defense, uh, the SOLVE ME-CFS initiative, and we've been very fortunate to have funding from a couple of uh, uh, one foundation, the Sunshine and Natural Wellbeing Foundation. The Boyce family uh, has created an endowed fund, as has the Caldwell family. We've had terrific uh, volunteers and helpers, Colleen Marden as the research coordinator and Renee Swope as the clinic nurse, uh, some excellent summer students and some uh, uh, others who have helped with fundraising, including Emily Steffensmeyer, who you see in the picture, uh, flanked by me, Ali Polo from Finland, and my physical therapist colleague, Rick Violand. And so we've had uh, many others supporting this work. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to stop there and see if we have questions. Thank you very much again for the invitation to be here.